like we didn't know that the Bible is full of message after message on the same passage. Uh, we never run out of ammunition when we're studying the Bible and preaching from the Bible and teaching from the Bible. It's just an, a bottomless barrel of oil that supplies our need. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. We'll read the first eight verses. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we take an excursion into your blessed holy word Lord, we're looking for lessons, life lessons, Lord, that will help us. And we can't find them and benefit from them unless you get involved in it. Lord, we can read it. We can talk about it. We can muse over it. But, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to take the truths of the Word of God and implant them within our soul that they might benefit us today and tomorrow and in the years to come. We pray that you'd bless in a very special way tonight. Help us to go away saying, I got some help from the Word of God. Lord, we're trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text shows us that life necessarily involves some things that have a time and a place and a purpose. Happy times are balanced by sad times, and even though pain and hurt might be included, there is an equilibrium accomplished that gives us what we need. Life is not always mountaintop. Life is not always in the valley. But God uses both to bring about a, a balance, an equilibrium. And God sometimes uses war to bring about peace. And he may want us to weep now in order to appreciate how to rejoice later. There is a constant struggle in life to find a proper balance so we don't get swept into excesses. We lean too far this way and we topple. We lean too far that way and we topple. Somewhere, according to the principles of the Word of God, there is a balance for the thou shalt nots, there is a there shall. And so finding that balance keeps us out of the excesses of life that can bring more pain and more hurt and a loss of eternal rewards. So our focus tonight is finding harmony, balance versus excess. Finding harmony in life. Seems like there's ups and downs and good and bad, joy and sadness. But we need harmony to get us on balance and we'll have to, number one, understand balance. Here's a, a dictionary definition of balance. Uh, if I can find it, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is. An amount of something that is more than necessary, permitted, or desirable. An amount of something that is more than necessary, permitted, or desirable. See, there's, there's things that God wants us to have on this side, and there's things God wants us to experience on that side, but we don't need to get too much of any one thing, but finding moderation in the balance. There is a danger in not finding that balance. Uh, imagine, if you will, and I don't know if, 
if our younger people know this or not, you've probably seen pictures maybe, but when I was growing up in, in our old barn or all, our old smokehouse, uh, there were balances, scales in there, and it, it would have like a heavy steel weight, looked like a, a bell, you know, like a cowbell or a small bell. It's solid iron on one end, and you could slide it according to the numbers on this end. On the other end was a hook where you could put whatever you wanted to weigh if you slid this over to 10 pounds. Maybe you've seen one similar to that in your doctor's office. It might be a little more refined than the ones I saw. And, and what? Museum. Museum. <laughs> yeah. But when you put the weight on there, getting the balance right in the center is the key. And if you get too much on this end, the other end tips up. Or if you get this end too far out that way, that end tips up. Excess and balance. Now ask yourself as we go through this tonight, are there some areas in my life that God would like to slide that weight back and forth till he gets my life in balance in a certain area? It may be in your family. It may be in your church life. It may be in your job. It may be in your finances. It could be in your emotions. In your health. Uh, there is a balance that I believe God wants us to have. Uh, and it's a dynamic thing to get that balance right. Now, Kenny Hale, <laughs> when he went to church here, Kenny and Pam went here years ago. Kenny and Pam both gone on to glory now, but Kenny had a stroke. And uh, he got kind of, you know, kind of over his stroke. He was able to get around and do stuff, and, but he still didn't have good balance. But Kenny wanted to take me fishing. And so we, he had a boat and motor, and, and you, you went with us too, didn't you, Aaron, when we went up to the lake? Was that not you? Uh, we went to the lake, and we're in his bass boat, and we're out there in, in the lake where the 90 feet of water are probably deep, and Kenny's up fooling around in the boat, walk, wobbling around, and, you know, and he's still not steady on his feet because he had that stroke. And he's wobbling around, and he gets over here. I said, Brother Kenny, do you want me to do something for you? He said, no, I'll get it. I just got a little tangle up in my fishing line. I'll, I'm fine. I'll get it. And boom, over he went, right in the lake. He's in there, and he's just going, fighting the water, and his legs are coming up, and his arms coming up, and his head's going down. And finally, we reach over and get him and pull him to the boat. And he makes his way, finally climbs back in the boat. I was bursting at the seams laughing at Kenny. And then I had a stroke. <laughs> and, and my balance wasn't very good and then I've wished many a times I wish I hadn't laughed at Kenny the Lord has shown me that uh, my balance is not so hot now either if you get overbalanced it's not a good thing and in our life in so many different areas of our life if we lose balance and we get too far in one way we've got excess are you with me? we've got excess and not balance and it can happen in any area what we need is God's wisdom. He says, the Lord says in Proverbs 3, 6, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You know why we're off balance sometimes? And you know why we fall to the excess on one side or the other? We don't acknowledge God the way we should. We tend to take his principles, and if we want to do, the principle seems to keep me from going too far that way, I reinterpret that, see, and you do too. We reinterpret that and say, well, I don't think that's exactly what God meant. Maybe I can go a little further this direction, and God, God will be okay with that, and we get overbalanced. We go to the excess. If we take a Bible principle too far, Outside of its biblical intent, we find excess and not balance. Kind of like if you read in Malachi, Malachi is scolding the Hebrew people uh, because they've been stealing the tithe from God. And, uh, and he gets to talking about how if they had tithed, they would have been blessed. Well, so you can get too far one way because God gives the principle that he's going to bless for tithing. Is that true? Well, I believe it is. And so 
He says, he's going to bless you for tithing. But what if I decide, okay, if he's going to bless me for tithing and giving offerings, then I'm just going to take my whole paycheck every week and just give it to the church, and I won't use any of it. Would you say that's a little overbalanced? Your bill collectors are going to start showing up on your doorstep. Your lights are going to go off. Your water is going to quit running. Uh, the garbage man is going to quit coming. If you don't pay your bills, see what happens if we go too far. Listen, if we go too far in a direction that God meant to be a good direction, we go too far, we slide that scale too far in one direction and over we go. So we violate another principle of God. If we're trying to give everything to, to the Lord's work, to the church, and not paying our bills, we violate the scripture that teaches we ought to owe no man anything, uh, that we ought to pay what's right and good and honest. And so if you're going to be honest, you've got to find that balance. I want to tithe, but I don't want to give so much that I can't pay who I owe. You see what I'm saying? I know that's, we have, so far I don't think we've had anybody in trouble that way, giving too much. Uh, like a, like a, Moses in the Old Testament when he was asking for offerings to build the tabernacle and people just giving and giving and giving. He said, whoa, whoa, stop, you're giving too much. I've never had to do that. <laughs> Nobody has ever disappointed me by giving too much. So, balance is what we're looking for. As I think it was Adrian Rogers when he was talking about the wisdom of God, we need some sanctified horse sense. Sanctified horse sense. And we don't have much of it anymore. People are always seem like so unwise going to one extreme or the other. Excess. Well, we've got to learn to live in harmony with God's will. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In other words, I'm not supposed to take the Bible and try to explain away this principle over here so I can get excess in this principle over here. <coughs> i got to just take what the Lord says and trust Him and not lean to my own understanding. You with me? Cults and heresies get started that way. They start trying to outthink God or stretching His words to mean more than He intended. <clears throat> there is a danger in excess. The amount of something that is more than necessary, permitted, or desirable. There's consequences to excess. For instance, when a parent is overbalanced with trying to show love to their children. Now stop right there just for a minute. Do you think the Bible teaches parents ought to love their children? That is a Bible principle. But wait, there is a balancing principle, that of chastisement, discipline. And so if a parent gets overloaded on the side, I love my child so much, I don't want to make them cry. I don't want to ever disappoint them. I don't want to ever make them sad. And if they begin to cry, then I just won't discipline them. Because after all, they're supposed to be happy. Well, if you don't discipline them, they will be a, turn out to be a brat and they'll end up breaking your heart worse than you ever dreamed if you don't discipline them. The Bible talks about chastisement in Hebrews chapter 12 and God, who is the perfect heavenly father, says he chastises his children, you and me who are saved. And if we don't chastise our children, we're not loving them. The Bible says in Proverbs that if we, if we don't discipline them, we actually show hate. In other words... We're doing to them something that's more hateful by not disciplining them. So you see how you can get overbalanced. The world is full of parents who don't discipline their children because they think they're supposed to just make them happy and keep them from crying 24 hours a day. Well, that's overbalanced. Boom, over we go. Excess. What's some examples that we might see in Scripture? Well, Solomon wrote this text, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the whole book. Uh, Solomon, did he go to excess in some areas? Boy, he did, didn't he? I mean, <clears throat> God had already said, in, I think it was in Deuteronomy, where he said he didn't want his, his kings to multiply horses and wives and gold and things like that. And what was Solomon all about? He's all about gathering gold, 
Horses. I, I went to one of these stables when I was in Israel on top of a whole mountain up there overlooking the valley of Megiddo. And there were rock stone stables on top of that mountain for as far as you can see, just about. He had all kinds of horses. And wives? <laughs> Does a thousand sound like a bunch? He multiplied wives, he multiplied horses, and he multiplied gold. I'd say he had some excesses. Now, he was a, a man that knew God, and eventually he turned out okay at the end before he died, but he lost out on a lot of blessing from the Lord through the middle of his life. So he's one example. Who's another one we could think of in Scripture? What about the excess of the prodigal son? He's living with a father who loves him, who takes care of him, who's going to give him his inheritance one day, but the son instead goes to the excess instead of waiting, having balance and saying, I'll wait until my father thinks the time is right or until he passes away, then I'll have my inheritance. But no, he went to his father and said, I want it now. I want mine right now. Give me my inheritance. I want to live it up. Wine, women, and song. And so he takes his loot and he hits it off to the, the wine, women, and song. And when he's wasted all of his money on his fickle friends and whorish women, then he's broke. Nobody comes to his aid. And he's wallowing in the mud of the hog pen. He went from feasting to famine, didn't he? Would you say that's excess on one side and the other? Now, the, the father could have gone to his son in the hog pen and said, Son, I don't want you to be in that old nasty hog pen. Come on, get out. Well, I'm going to take you home and I'm going to wash you up. I'm going to give you clean clothes and I'm going to give you some more money and you can go back down there and drink and do drugs and have the women and all of that. But the father didn't do that, did he? The father stood over there. He stood his ground as the good father would and he let that boy suffer. <laughs> that boy came to hunger and want and the father did the right thing by not rescuing him. And listen, parents ought not to rescue their children out of every little tiff they get into. If They need to learn to work out their own problems. They need to learn there's times when you'll hurt. They need to learn that there's times when you won't get everything you want. And that father did that for the boy. What happened because of it? The boy finally hurt enough that he repented. He repented. Because the father didn't get overbalanced and run to his rescue. Well, we're talking about excess and balance. And so we need to find harmony. How do we do it? Through discipline, self-control. And when I say self-control, I'm not talking about something apart from the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about self-control that is put into place by the Holy Spirit. We need to get back to desiring the old-fashioned filling of the Holy Ghost of God. Holy Spirit living is what will rescue us from the excesses. We have to control ourselves. Galatians 5, and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We've got to get back to living as spirit-filled Christians and then we can know the wisdom of God and then we can recognize when we're getting off balance on one side or the other and going to excess. we got to get back to studying and praying and working our way through Bible principles and applying them to our life. Psalm 119, 105. We ought to draw close to God. James 4, 8. So... Let's flesh this out to the rest of this message. That's my outline. That's all I got. I was going to talk now. <laughs> but it's going to hurt. But sometimes we have to feel a little jab before we get in a better situation to receive what God wants for us in life. Do you know that 
You can love your children so much that you can abdicate your role as a parent, mom. If you protect that child from discipline from dad, you are taking his role and you are dominating him. The Bible says that the man is to be the head of the house. And they got oodles of amens right there. And the man is where the buck stops. The buck stops here. That's what the Bible teaches. Read Ephesians chapter 5 and you'll get the message. But wait a minute. <clears throat> it is possible for mom to step out of her role as the mother and, and defending her children against the father. But wait, Dad. You can step out of your role and you, you can avoid erroneously taking your role as bringing those children up in the nourishment and, and nurture and admonition of the Lord. And you can, dad, father, husband, you can get to the point where instead of being the head of the house, you become the tyrant of the house. <laughs> you go, you, you come home and sit down, and she's been working all day just like you have, and you go home and sit down and say, Woman, get me a glass of tea, hand me the remote, pop some popcorn, and pull my socks off and massage my feet, and become a tyrant. <laughs> we have just gained access to excess on the other side. Stay in your role, Mom. Stay in your role, Dad. Do what the Bible says and don't, don't take your role as an excuse to overpower your mate or your children. We should discipline our children. I've said that two or three times already and I think that's the big need in our culture today is most kids don't have a daddy in the home and when they do, he's either drunk all the time or doing drugs or he's never home. <coughs> And there has to be a male role model for a family usually to turn out right. Now, I thank God for the single mothers that's working hard to be both mom and dad. But dad, you should have stayed home and been the father. You shouldn't have made the woman do it by herself. And if dad would stay home and be the right kind of dad, love his wife, love his children, there wouldn't be, have to be a lot of abuse going on when I say discipline children, I'm not talking about drawing blood and breaking bones. We're not talking about abuse. We're talking about using a little hickory switch and, and sting those legs and their hiney until they start doing right. And if they start crying, the Bible says in Proverbs, spare not for their crying. You'll think they're going to die. They'll think they're going to die, but you go ahead and discipline them anyway and you'll save their soul from torment on this earth and possibly from hell. But you better love those kids. You see, if, we, if we're only disciplinarian, and we're, just, we're, a, we're a policeman, man. We've got we to gotta find out who's doing wrong in the family and work them over, whether it's the kids or the wife. Man, we're going to club them every time we find them doing something wrong. That's, not, that's going to the excess on that side. But then if you go to the other side and you do all of your work and all of your wife's work, and let her lounge, and the kids go wild, you've erred on the other side. You can't be all lovey-dovey all the time, mister. You've got to be a dad and a husband. Yes, be a hard worker, but share the responsibility. I, I hear them say sometimes, well, marriage is not a 50-50 deal. It's a 100%, 100% deal. Well, I don't think I agree with that 100%. <laughs> I think it ought to be 50% the man doing, doing half of what goes on in the family and 50% of the wife doing what goes on in the family and sharing that and together that's 100%. But the wife shouldn't have to take over everything from the husband and the husband shouldn't take over everything from the wife. It ought to be distributed evenly. Now, if my wife was uh, bed fast and she couldn't get out of bed, I'd be washing the dishes every meal. If she couldn't get out of bed, she's, she's got health problems, uh, she's crippled, then I would be vacuuming the floors every day. I'd be sweeping and mopping and doing all of that stuff because she's not able. But if she's able, I want her doing her half. <laughs> 
And the kids, don't forget the kids. Get them involved in the chores. Uh, they need to be doing something. Learn a little responsibility. If we make everything easy on the kids, we slide to the excess of making life seem like it's a, supposed to be a bed of roses to them. And when they get to be adults, sooner or later somebody's going to disappoint them and they'll fall apart. Uh, it's our job to train them. Life isn't always fair. I spent the afternoon, a good deal of the afternoon, sitting on the tailgate of a truck talking to Aubrey's brother. His brother's 87 years old, still working in the roofing business. <laughs> My wife doesn't want me to get on the roof, and, and uh, I'm only 39. <laughs> and she, uh, uh, sitting on the tailgate of that truck, talking to uh, Lyndall. We were waiting for the funeral home to bring the hearse to uh, pick up Aubrey's body, and I didn't want to leave until they came. And so we're sitting on the tailgate of the truck, and he was telling me about his wife passed away in February, and now his last brother passed away to just the last couple of days. And I said, man, that, that's tough. He said, well, life does get tough. I said, life's not fair, is it? He said, no, it doesn't seem like it's always fair. I said, well, it's, in reality, it's not always fair. And it sounds like you've learned already that life doesn't always go the way you wish it would. And he said, yeah, you're right. And we, we talked about things. I was glad to hear his testimony that he's a Christian, been born again. And uh, he said, I wouldn't, he said, I, I wouldn't want, I don't like to lose Aubrey, but he said, I know he wouldn't want to come back from where he is now. I said, you're right, he wouldn't. He learned that life's not fair. You know what you and I need to learn? If we're going to have balance in life, we need to learn that life's not fair. It's not comely for a Christian to become such a victim that their only focus is negative. I have an acquaintance that is continually playing the victim card. Uh, everybody hates her. Everybody's against her. Everybody's persecuting her. And I see her posts on social media often about how somebody's mistreated her and they've mistreated her. And it's just like, she wants to get vengeance on them. Can I just tell you that life's not always fair? And persecution may come, probably will to most Christians. But you know when Jesus was being tried and placed on the cross, the Bible says he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. He didn't call a legion of angels from heaven. He willingly laid down his life. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. There is a time coming when God will keep score and get even with everybody. It ought not to be our job. It's not our job to get even with people or to try to make life seem to be fair all the time because it's not. And we, we learn to cope with it. I put this on Facebook today hoping that it might be an encouragement to somebody that ask yourself the question, do people, are people more glad when you walk into a room or when you exit? <laughs> what brings them the most joy, when you enter a room or when you leave it? Well, I would hope that I could be enough of an encourager and pleasant enough and gracious enough that when I walk into a room that people say, yeah, he's all right. You know, he's ugly, but he's all right. <laughs> I would not want to be that person that when I walked out of the room, everybody said, yay, he's gone, he's gone. Now we can have a good time. <laughs> I don't want to be the life of the party, but I don't want to be the party pooper either. You know what I mean? And when life is not fair, showing a gracious spirit will keep us from becoming overbalanced into the negative side. It will keep us from being overbalanced on the sinful, excessive side when a new Christian learns that, hey, security is eternal. I'm saved and I'm never going to lose it. You know what unbalance, what excess is? If they say, well, if I'm not going to lose it, then I can do anything I want to do. 
No, balance is saying, I'm free from sin and the penalty of sin. I don't have to go to hell. But because he freed me, I love him and I don't want to disappoint him. So I'm, going, I'm not going off into the sin of licentiousness. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm just going to love him and be as gracious as he was. Balance in life. I fear that as I look around today in, in our world today, I think there's just an awfully lot of people who are unbalanced. They lean way too far over here or way too far over there. And what's that little game where you stack up all those little blocks and you pull them out one at a time and sometimes it falls over? Jenga? Yeah. Life's kind of that way. And don't yank the things out that's going to cause you to be unbalanced and flop. We need balance. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that your word gives us hope and encouragement and direction and instruction. Lord, I pray that we would seek your face and seek your will, seek the filling of the Holy Spirit, that we might live a balanced Christian life, not one of compromise, not one of licentiousness, not one of being overly stern or strict, just a life that's balanced. Lord, help us to find our balance in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd bless us during this invitation time. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you need to pray, feel.